Greetings once again. Our talk here is going to be on cervical screening and dysplasia. You may remember I did a lecture on this a while back, about a year ago or so. And since then, or maybe a little bit before then, but unbeknownst to me, the recommendations have changed rather dramatically. And part of that is that uh, I didn't do a great job of making sure that I had all the up-to-date recommendations. But another part of it is due to the fact that ACOG, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, are rather notorious for frequently updating and changing their recommendations, which is a headache to us. But it's a good thing because it's always important to have the latest up-to-date and evidence-based guidelines so that we are treating our patients in the best way that science tells us to do. Okay, so let's start with a vignette. A 22-year-old female graduate student presents to the University Health Center for a physical exam. She has no complaints at this time and simply wants to establish care with a physician. She has no significant past medical history, no major health issues, and she's on no medications. She has had sexual intercourse one time in her life, which was with a long-term boyfriend. It was last year, and she says that they use protection. She's never been pregnant, apart from coming in for routine vaccinations. She's not been seen by a physician since her high school physical seven years ago, which outpatient gynecologic procedure is most appropriate at this time. So, uh, there's really not a whole lot to discuss here. We have a 22-year-old uh, female, no apparent distress, here for a, uh, to establish care uh, with a physician. And you see our friendly physician right here. Maybe a nurse practitioner, maybe a PA. Doesn't really matter. She's just here to establish care. What does she need at this time? Obviously, she needs a pap smear. That's the focus of our talk here, but it is very important that, you sh that you're aware that this is a very important and, and crucial part of a well-woman well checkup uh, starting at age 21, and she's 22 years old, and she hasn't been seen since she was in high school, so this is something that she needs now. So we're going to talk about the importance and the timing of pap smears. This has changed since, uh, since I did our last lecture a while back. Uh, October 2016 was the most recent change in guidelines. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the abnormal cytology we get from PAPs. This is what the results that we get from pap smear. It can be either normal or it can be one of these five things. Ask us, L cell, ask H, H cell, and AGC, atypical glandular cells. And then depending on how the cytology comes back, we may or may not get a biopsy. And that biopsy is done via colposcopy. And we'll talk about what we do after the pap, whether we proceed to colposcopy or whether we sit on that and wait. And then with the biopsy, we get a determination as to whether this is, there's carcinoma cells, uh, squamous cells that are uh, abnormal. And namely here, we're talking about squamous cancer, squamous cell carcinoma. About 80% will be squamous, the other 20% will, uh, will be adenocarcinoma. And this is divided up into SIN 1, 2, 3, and then cervical cancer, which here we're talking about invasive cancer. There's also something called uh, cervical carcinoma in situ, CIS, which is sort of between SIN 3 and invasive cervical cancer. Okay, that's CIS here. Okay. So this is our anatomy. The cervix is right here. So you know that the vagina is what you can see. That's what you're visualizing when you take your speculum and you open up the, the, the uh, vulva. And you see the vagina and then that little tiny hole. That's the opening to the cervix, namely the external orifice. In between there and the uterus is the canal known as the cervix. It's roughly four centimeters in length. Uh, and that external orifice is roughly one centimeter in diameter uh, when the woman is not giving birth. Uh, that external orifice actually gets to be about 10, 11 centimeters in, in diameter when the woman is giving birth. But aside from that, it's only about one centimeter in diameter. The cervix is about four centimeters in length. That obviously shortens too. 
uh, when uh, the woman is giving birth. So four centimeters, roughly the size of your pinky. Going into the uterus, we have the internal orifice. So there's two parts of the cervix that you want to be aware of as far as doing PAPs. So the outer part that is uh, adjacent to the vagina is known as the ecto cervix, and there's an important area in there called the transitional zone, which I'll show you in a little bit. Within the canal is what's known as the endo cervix, inside the cervix, endo cervix. Uh, and that's four centimeters in length. And then the internal orifice, and then we're at endometrial tissue inside the uterus. Okay. So this is Dr. Georgios Nikolaou, Papa Nikolaou. He's a Greek-American cytopathologist, and he had this crazy idea back in the early 20th century that cellular debris could give us clues about not only whether or not there was any kind of cancerous process going on, but also where the woman is at in her menstrual cycle. And the way he found out about this is actually pretty interesting. He had his wife get up onto the couch and he took scrapings from her cervix every day. It's a very brave woman. And uh, what he found was that from day to day, those cells changed. And what he was looking at was the cells that came out of the uterus because those cells would change, those endometrial cells would change uh, based on where she's at in her cycle. Uh, he also took scrapings from other women and found that there was a correlation to women who had cervical cancer and how those cells looked and women who didn't have cervical cancer and how their cells looked. And so in 1928, when he was 45 years old, he presented his findings to a medical conference in Michigan and was basically laughed out of the room. Uh, they didn't, they, they thought this idea was crazy and uh, nothing, no real advances were made on this because nobody really believed what he had to say. About 15 years later, he teamed up with a gynecologist by the name of Herbert Trout, and they published a paper on the predictive values of these cells in detecting cancer. And in the coming decades, this idea gained some traction, and by the 1970s we were doing, uh, it, was, it became recommended that we do these, uh, these smears, which became, later became known as pap smears for Papa Nicolau, uh, on women routinely to screen for cervical cancer. And as our methods refined themselves over time, we now have the modern pap smear, which has been a tremendous benefit to women. Unfortunately, Dr. Papanikolaou died in the 1960s, so he never actually got to see uh, the incredible uh, uh, results of the fruition of his, uh, of his research and, and his work. And uh, as we're going to see here, the Morbidity and mortality has dramatically decreased. Now, this graph doesn't make it look like a lot, but if you look at the mortality in 1970 before we started doing the routine screens and to 2000, we have about half the mortality as we had back then. So significant, significant drop. Now, as you might notice here, if you go from 1990 to 2000, the incidence has actually gone up although the mortality is uh, roughly the same. Why has the incidence gone up? Probably has something to do with increased sexual promiscuity among the general population. As you know, cervical cancer and cervical dysplasia is triggered by the human papilloma virus. It's the only cancer that we're aware of, uh, or at least the only common cancer that we're aware of, that uh, is caused by an infectious pathogen. And not only does it matter who the woman is having sex with, but it matters who the woman's partner has had sex with. Men carry HPV, but there's very few problems for the man aside from genital warts and the, the, the serovars of HPV that cause genital warts are not the same as the ones that cause cancer. And so for men, it's not a big deal. You carry HPV, so what? It's a big deal if you're the female partner of that man. As you may have seen in the cervical cancer lecture, uh, there are men who harbor this, this virus and have passed it on to wife number one. She dies of cervical cancer, passes it on to wife number two. She dies of cervical cancer. And yeah, it's a big deal if the man carries a, a virulent strain, uh, namely 
uh, HPV 16, HPV 18, etc. Uh, if he carries it, then his wife, his female partners are at risk. And this is another reason why it's very, very important to stress to your patients that the, the Gardasil vaccine, which protects, boosts the immunity against the more virulent strains of HPV, why that vaccine is so important. That vaccine is given in adolescence. And it's given in adolescence not because we're super concerned about teens having sex, I mean, a lot of them are, but it's really given during that time because you get the optimal response. If you give that vaccine to a 30-year-old, you're not going to get the same kind of response uh, to the vaccine. And so not only is it to protect them now, but it's to protect them down the road. And you may get parents that say, well, my kid's not having sex. My kid is, I, I, we come from a Christian household, and my daughter is not going to have sex until she gets married. You know, fat chance. But uh, that may be what you're told. And what you need to stress to these parents is that it doesn't matter how many people your daughter has sex with, but it also matters how many people your daughter's future husband has had sex with. Because if he's had sex with 20 women and now he settles down, it's highly likely that he is carrying one of those virulent strains of HPV. And so everybody should be getting these vaccines. Now we also give these vaccines to young boys. Why do we give them to young boys? Quite simple. If we give the Gardasil vaccine to young boys, the thought is that he will have an immunity now against those more virulent strains of HPV and uh, he will not be an asymptomatic carrier. And it's really these boys that are the culprits because if they are asymptomatic carriers, then their female partners are at their mercy. So Gardasil vaccine, very, very important that you be aware of that and that you stress its importance to your patients. And I will also add that just some epidemiology, uh, cervical cancer is the third most common malignancy in women worldwide overall, but there's a big disparity in uh, developing countries versus industrialized countries. In developing countries, it is the second most common cause of gynecologic cancer death in developing countries. In industrialized countries, it's not even in the top 10. So big disparity. And what's the reason for that? The pap smear. The pap smear is tremendously successful in preventing cervical cancer from developing. We catch it earlier. And we don't get that kind of preventative care in, in developing countries. Uh, so that's one of the important things about us looking out in industrialized countries, those of us who are blessed with all this capital and all these resources, to look out for our less fortunate uh, brethren. Uh, we want to make sure that these, uh, that these developing countries are, are getting these resources so that, they can, uh, so that we can prevent cervical cancer in, in women over there. Because it's much cheaper to treat women for uh, for CIN uh, than it is to treat women for cervical cancer. And so it, just from a cost perspective, it's good uh, to get that out to them. Okay, The incidence in industrialized countries is roughly 4 to 10 cases per 100,000. This is for cervical cancer. In Eastern Africa, it's 34 and a half cases per 100,000. So some 8 to 10 times more frequent. Okay, the median age of diagnosis of cervical cancer is 52, but uh, when it comes to diagnosing, uh, when it comes to diagnosing cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, SIN, uh, that could be like SIN 1, SIN 2, SIN 3, it's most commonly diagnosed when a woman is in her 20s. When it comes to carcinoma in situ, it's most commonly diagnosed in a woman roughly age 25 to 35, but cervical cancer typically, invasive cervical cancer typically is not diagnosed in a woman until her 40s or 50s. It takes some time for this to progress. That's not to say women in their 20s can't get cervical cancer. They certainly do, but the median age is a little bit higher than it is for these abnormal pap smears, which come back, you know, a lot of times in their 20s and 30s. That age is probably going to drop just because of the sexual promiscuity. 
uh, and as the age of first sexual intercourse drops as well. So the pap smear is one of the cornerstones of the gynecologic visit. You should always be aware of a woman's record when she had her last pap, if she's ever had a pap, what the results of her last pap were because it's going to influence how you manage your patients. And I should add here that the official guidelines from ACOG are different depending on the woman's age. So if she's 20, age 21 to 24, we're a little bit more conservative on treating her than if she's older than 24. And the reason for that is that the treatment for some of these more, uh, I mean, for even for SIN1, the treatment can include something called a LEAP, which we're going to talk about later. And the drawback to doing a LEAP, which is our treatment for getting rid of, of dysplastic tissue, is that it shortens the cervix. And if a woman is going to be bearing children, if she's got a short cervix, that's a problem. That, leads to, that can lead to obstetrical complications, namely cervical insufficiency and that can lead to preterm labor. So we're a little bit more conservative when it comes to younger women. You don't need to be aware of the, the, the little details about how we go about the differences, of how we go about managing uh, SIN 1, SIN 2, SIN 3, depending on the age, uh, but you, you should just have a general idea and know that in younger women, we try to be a little bit more conservative when we can. Now, if a 21-year-old has SIN 3, yes, we're going to be doing a leap. Uh, but if it's SIN 1, it's kind of a gray area. We tend to be a little bit more conservative in younger women. The pap smear is very simple in practice. So what we're doing here is we have, of course, our speculum, which we take uh, and basically spreads apart the, the walls of the vulva. So we get a good look at the vagina. Uh, this is your basic speculum here. Uh, some of the newer speculums have fiber optic lights, which can give a nice good view of the vagina. Uh, if you don't have, like this one, if you don't have fiber optic light, then you have to use like a flashlight or a, a lamp behind you to illuminate the vagina and the cervix. These two tools here, this one up here, this kind of yellowish one, this is called a spatula. What we do here is we get a sample of the ecto cervix. So we just take this, kind of scrape the ecto cervix along the transitional zone. Do I have? I don't. There it is. Okay, so here's our ecto cervix we see right here. This is the vagina out here, and then this is the ecto cervix. And you can see this tissue here. See how it's kind of going from pink to red? This border here is called the transitional zone and this is very important because this is where cervical cancer is most likely to develop. So we want to get a good scraping of this this uh, this transitional zone. And the cervix is very friable tissue so even taking that little spatula and just getting a little scraping you're probably going to have a little bit of blood from that, a little bit. And then we take this brush here, you can see it has bristles on the end, and we go into the cervix and we get a sample of the endocervix. And so we have cells both from the ectocervix and the endocervix. And we'll want to know that because if we have the cells coming back abnormal from one or the other, then we know where the lesion is at. Okay, so this is the cervix here. And the cervix is, uh, like I said, four centimeters from roughly from, from the vagina to the uterus. And it's about one centimeter or about a, like, like the size of your finger, your pinky finger, uh, in diameter. So your pinky gives you a good idea of, of the anatomy of the cervix. Okay, so to pap or not to pap, that is the question. And these recommendations, like I said, have changed. So let's talk about it. The very first pap smear should take place at age 21. Okay, it used to be age 21 or three years after the first intercourse, whichever was younger, but now it is age 21 for everybody. So even if she had sex at 13, used to be we would get her first pap smear at 16, now no, we get it at 21. 21 for everybody, first pap smear at 21. And we only do cytology. So you're going to see in some of the older women, older than 30, we do both a cytology and HPV testing. For women under the age of 30, age 21 to 30, we only get cytology, so we just do the pap. So after her first pap smear, subsequent paps should take place every three years, as far as routine pap smears, 
They should be taking place every three years until at least age 30. So the important here, this is if as long as they're coming back normal. If she's coming back with with abnormal results, we may we we will probably do it again in in one year. So, for instance, if she comes back with ASCUS, which is uh, atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, and go back here, we have all this list here of of abnormal cytology. If it comes back as ASCUS, for instance, then we're going to repeat her PAP in one year. But otherwise, if it comes back normal, we're going to repeat her PAP in three years. Okay, and that's a change from our previous guidelines where we did it every year uh, in while she was in her 20s. Now we just do it every three years. But if it comes back abnormal, the guidelines change. We need to be a little bit more surveillant. Starting at age 30, then we add this new thing to it, okay? So she should continue to receive her routine PAPs every three years, provided they come back normal. But we can we have the option of doing HPV testing, and this is done in addition to the PAP. So we can do PAP plus HPV testing, and if we do that, provided it comes back normal, then that we only have to do every five years. Okay, so if she just gets the regular routine PAP, it's every three years, if, it's, uh, if it comes back normal. Uh, if she gets the PAP and the HPV testing, then it can be done every five years. Okay, so when can we stop doing PAPs? And the answer to that is usually at age 65, but there's some caveats here. So if she's ever been diagnosed, if, let's say she had abnormal PAP results, and that came back as h cell, and then she got a, a biopsy, and that came back as SIN2 or SIN3, or carcinoma in situ, or cervical cancer, then we cannot stop at age 65 necessarily. In that case, she needs to be more than 20 years removed from her treatment for that lesion. Uh, so if she was, let's say, 50 when she was diagnosed with SIN2, then we can't stop PAPs until age 70, okay? So if the patient has never had or is more than 20 years removed from SIN2, then routine PAPs can be discontinued at 65. Otherwise, we have to wait 20 years after her abnormal result of SIN2 or greater before we can discontinue it, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. If the patient has had a total hysterectomy that wasn't performed for reasons of cancer, then she can discontinue PAPs indefinitely, again, provided that she has not had an abnormal PAP in the last 20 years. And by abnormal PAP, I mean you get your, dyspla or you get your dysplastic cells and then you do a biopsy and she's sent to or higher. So essentially, we're treating patients with a total hysterectomy the same as if they turned 65 that day. So if she's never had SIN2 or greater, we can stop PAPs. If she had a uh, SIN2 10 years ago, then we have to wait another 10 years before we can stop PAPs. Another caveat is that women with significant risk factors for cervical cancer should be discouraged from discontinuing PAPs. So these are going to be women who have HIV or are immunocompromised, women who were exposed to diethylstilbestrol, uh, in utero, those women are getting quite old now. That was back in the 1950s. A lot of these women now are into their 60s. Uh, and then patients who are on chronic steroids. These women are at increased risk for cervical cancer, and so we recommend that they don't stop uh, getting their PAPs. Okay, so we do the PAP smear, and we get our results back. This is, these are read by a cytopathologist and you don't need to have any understanding of what the cells look like. That will all be done for you. All you need to know is when you do the PAPs, especially when you do routine PAPs. So the cytopathologist will look at these cells under a microscope, and most of the time they'll see the cells and they look normal. But occasionally you'll have abnormal cells. And when these abnormal cells come back, the cytopathologist will give you these one of these acronyms, and you should be aware of what they mean. So the first, which you heard me refer to earlier, is called ASCUS, A-S-C-U-S, which stands for Atypical Squamous Cells of Undetermined Significance. What this means is that the cytopathologist has looked under the microscope and she sees something abnormal about these cells, but she's not exactly sure what it means. Okay, undetermined significance. 
they look they don't look normal, but we don't know exactly what it is. And so when it comes back as ask us, we have a variety of paths we can go down. Uh, but most commonly, when it comes to women over the age of 24, our very next step is going to be to get HPV testing. And depending on whether it comes back positive for a high-risk HPV, we may do a colposcopy. And that colposcopy, then you get a biopsy, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Another way to com come back is L-cell. What L-cell means is that the pathologist has looked at the cells, and she sees that it's consistent with some kind of lesion that is low-grade. It's abnormal, and it looks like low-grade, uh, like a low-grade lesion. Okay, and that can be like SIN1. What this means is that uh, you are going to, you're, you're certainly going to need to get an HPV test if the woman is over 24. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about management 21 to 24 because it gets very complicated because we are a little bit more nuanced because we want to be more conservative. Uh, but certainly in a woman over the age of 24, we want to get an HPV test. If it comes back positive for a, a more virulent strain of HPV, then we certainly go on to get a colposcopy. Another way it can come back is ASCH, A-S-C-H, which stands for atypical squamous cells, and you can't exclude high grade. So here the pathologist has looked at the cells, and they look really nasty. But she can't say for sure if it's a high-grade squamous interepithelial lesion, which we'll talk about next. So these cells look really, really, really ominous, and so in this case, we're always going to get colposcopy. Always, always, always colposcopy with ASCH. Okay, and then the next way it can come back is HCIL, high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And what this means is that the cytopathologist is pretty sure it's consistent with SIN2 or SIN3, and those are the cases that we have to treat. Uh, and so you'll want to be aware of this. Certainly for HCIL, our next step is going to be colposcopy, but in a minority of patients, if she elects to do so, particularly if she really doesn't care to have any more kids, you can go straight on to treatment. You can go straight on to LEAP. Okay, and then the last, another way that you can have this come back, you have a different set of cells altogether called glandular cells, and this is coming from, uh, from the uterus. And if these cells come back, you have atypical glandular cells, more than likely you're going to want to get an endometrial sampling because this is more consistent with, uh, with some kind of process going on in the uterus. Remember that Dr. Papa Nicolau saw abnormal cells not only from the cervix, but he also believed that it could be predictive for issues going on in the uterus, and that is indeed what we see with atypical glandular cells. So with the exception of ASCUS, all abnormal PAPs in women over the age of 24 are going to proceed to colposcopy and biopsy. With ASCUS, typically we rely on that HPV testing. Okay, you don't need to, for if you're t taking the USMLE, you don't need to be aware of all these algorithms. Okay, that's going to be something for gynecology boards, uh, women's health, stuff like that. But for USMLE, step two, step three, what you need to be aware of is if you have ASCUS, then we want to know about the HPV testing. Otherwise, just concern yourself with sort of the routine guidelines. So women with ASCUS get the HPV test. If it's positive, then she should get a colposcopy and biopsy. Otherwise, uh, if, uh, if, if it comes back negative for the high-risk HPV, then you can repeat in three years. All right, so this is the col uh, colposcope. So this colposcope just looks kind of like a microscope, like a periscope, and all it is is sort of binoculars for the vagina and the cervix. And so you're getting a really good close look because as we're going to see, some of the morphological changes of the cervix and, and, and the vagina can point us towards whether uh, or not, and if so, where the dysplasia is going on. Because when you get a biopsy, you want to make sure that you're getting a biopsy of where you think this process is going on. Because if you go in, if you have abnormal cells and you go in and you take a biopsy of normal cervical tissue, you're going to get a false negative. 
and we don't want to do that. So what we do with this colposcope is we look for abnormal tissue and then we biopsy there because that's going to be our result. Okay, so with the colposcope, all you're doing is your typical speculum examination and you're looking through the colposcope to look for abnormal tissue. So what tissue are we looking for? One of the first things that you do when you have your colposcope is you take some acetic acid, like vinegar, and you stain the cervix. And these areas that stain white tend to be abnormal tissue. And so you can take a biopsy of this whiter looking tissue. And this is usually going to be around the transitional zone because remember that is the most common area for cervical dysplasia to develop. So that's a dead giveaway. If the tissue comes back white with acetic acid, get a biopsy there. Another abnormality that we are looking for, areas that are mosaic-like in appearance. So notice this sort of cobblestoning. This doesn't have any acetic acid on it. So here we have this cobblestoning. This is abnormal. Notice, going back here, so notice this tissue around here and sort of around here. It's very confluent. Here we have some cobblestoning going on. This is abnormal, and so you should probably take a biopsy of this area as well. Okay, so this is just a better look at that cobblestoning. Also, areas that display punctated vessels. So what these are are vessels that are coming up and down and migrating up and down the, the cervical tissue. And these punctate lesions are, uh, are consistent with areas of dysplasia. So these little bumps that kind of look like a strawberry. This should be biopsied. And then anything with abnormal, oh no. Okay, okay, I do have normal. Okay, so, uh, all right, so this is normal vessel geography. Notice that the, the vessels kind of come out here of the cervix, and they are large, and then they kind of arborize, and they form smaller branches as they migrate out of the cervix and into vaginal tissue. This is totally normal, and okay, this is normal. Ways that it can be abnormal is if these vessels are kind of just going every which way. They're not forming this sort of tree-like pattern. Or here, where you're forming these like hairpin loops. Notice that here, where it's not really arborizing, but the, the vessels are turning around and making these, you know, 180-degree turns. Or if they're not getting thinner as you move out. So notice here, we have sort of thicker vessels, and then they become thinner as they move out. Here, they're actually even becoming thicker as they move out, so that's abnormal. And then, of course, these hairpin loops here. Look at how these turn. They turn 180 degrees and then go backwards, and they might even get thicker. Okay, this is abnormal vessel geography. Okay, So areas that stain white with acetic acid, areas that are mosaic-like in appearance, areas that display punctated vessels, and areas with abnormal vessel geography. Okay. So you take the biopsy after colposcopy, and what this is going to tell you is the depth of invasion. So the pap smear only tells us if we have abnormal cells. It gives us no idea of how, how deeply those abnormal cells have migrated. That's important because you may have abnormal cells, but you don't know if this patient just has some abnormal cells, uh, just a, a, a thin layer of abnormal cells, or if this is full thickness and has invaded the basement membrane and you have full-blown invasive cervical cancer. So you need the biopsy to tell you how deep the lesion has, has, has gone. So the histologist will give you a designation of SIN1, SIN2, SIN3, carcinoma in situ, or invasive cervical cancer. And these designations are based on the depth of the abnormal cells and, importantly, whether or not the basement membrane is intact. If you have invasion of the basement membrane, we consider that invasive cancer. Okay, so this is the normal cervix. And what you should be aware of if you're taking step one, not so much for step two and three, is what dysplastic cells look like. So the dysplastic cells will have more, uh, will have larger nuclei, more eccentric nuclei. This is kind of a grainy picture here, uh, but notice that these more purple-looking cells are are just restricted to the very, very deep layers of the cervical tissue, and these become 
uh, more eccentric and, and more purple staining uh, with progressing sin. So sin one is restricted. So notice the abnormal cells here. It roughly ends about right here. So sin one is restricted to the deep one third of the epithelium. Sin two is going to be about two thirds of the epithelium. So here it ends about right here. This is sin two. Sin three is going to be more than two thirds of the epithelium all the way up to full thickness. And you can make the argument here that this is full thickness. I mean, notice these cells here, they're like ovular in shape. And if you were to zoom in here, these cells are more circular in shape. So look at these cells. These are normal cells up here. They're circular in shape. These cells are like ovular. Look at these cells. They're like stretched out, ovular, uh, ovoid looking cells. And they go all the way up to here in, in SYN3, so more than two thirds. And if you had carcinoma in situ, they would go all the way up to the surface. And then of course, invasive cervical cancer, you would penetrate the basement membrane. Here's the basement membrane right here. If you had these abnormal cells pushing down through into the basement membrane, penetrating the basement membrane, in that case it would be uh, cervical, invasive cervical cancer. Okay, for step two and step three, you don't need to be aware of any of this. You don't need to know any of what this looks like. Step one, you got to kind of know this. All right, so it kind of sucks to take step one because you feel like you need to know more, but that's the way boards are, unfortunately, in this country. So what do you do now? You have a histologic diagnosis, gives you the information you need in deciding what therapeutic intervention should be taken, as well as information regarding prognosis and surveillance. So as I mentioned earlier, the guidelines for SYN1 and ASCUS as well are, are going to, and ELSO and H, so, uh, but for SYN1 and your, your abnormal cellular results, those really are going to vary based on age. So 21 to 24 is kind of in a different category from everybody else. But as you get more progressed, so SYN2, SYN3, carcinoma, and situ, they're really more or less the same because if you're talking SYN2, SYN3, carcinoma, and situ, you got a problem on hand. And, and while, yes, it's always good to balance the woman's future ability to bear children and the risks that are involved with doing LEAP, if it's SYN2, SYN3, carcinoma, and situ, we're more concerned about this girl, this woman developing cancer. Uh, but if it's SYN1, as we're going to see with the statistics, a lot of these cases are going to regress on their own. So, like I said, we're a little bit more conservative with women who are younger. Uh, so for SYN1, we're going to get an HPV. Usually, we'll just get an HPV reflex uh, test. But then, based on that, uh, we'll, we'll get, in most cases, we'll get a PAP and an HPV test in one year. And if we have, from there, if we have abnormal results, uh, we'll get a repeat colposcopy and biopsy. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, I think I explained this already. Uh, so, SYN1, uh, you get, uh, repeat colposcopy and biopsy with abnormal results and uh, with normal results you can return to annual pap smear. So I'll just briefly go over the guidelines for SYN1 for women over the age of 24. Just keep in mind that for women between 21 and 24 it's slightly different. You can go on ACOG and look this up if you want. So for SYN1 you're going to do this uh, pap and HPV testing in one year and if you have anything greater than, if, if you have any abnormal uh, cytology at all, so ask us and beyond, uh, or the woman comes back HPV positive, then you're going to do colposcopy. If she comes back HPV negative and a normal pap, then you can just do regular annual pap smear. So she has to have a normal pap and a normal HPV. If one of these is abnormal, you're going to repeat colposcopy and biopsy. Okay? So anything beyond SYN1, if it's SYN2, SYN3, or carcinoma in situ, you're going to have to get resection. So re we do resection most of the time by a procedure called LEAP, which stands for Loop Electrical Excision Procedure. There's other ways you can do this. You can do uh, like a cryotherapy where you're freezing the, uh, the, the cells off. Uh, you can burn them off. You can do cervical coinization. 
uh, but leap is the most common procedure that's done. And uh, we're typically doing this for anything SIN2 or beyond. But if it's a woman under the age of 24, sometimes with SIN2 we'll wait on it. Uh, but for most women, SIN2 and beyond, you're going to be doing LEAP. Okay, so this is what LEAP is. So all you're doing is you're taking a little bit out of the front of the cervix, uh, a little bit of the ectocervix, most of the, uh, or sorry, a little bit of the endocervix, uh, a lot of the ectocervix, and then this tissue is going to scar with time. But unfortunately, you've thinned the, the functional cervix, and so this woman now has an increased risk of obstetrical complications. Uh, but this is the, the excision. Okay, now this is not a biopsy. This is excision. You're going to biopsy this to make sure that you have clear margins and that you've taken out all the dysplastic tissue. But this is not what we do for biopsy. When you go in with the, cul the, the colposcope, and you're doing a biopsy, you're just taking small little samples. And for the most part, that's not going to affect the woman. Uh, you're not going to cause obstetrical complications with that. This is therapeutic. Okay, so in this case, we are taking out the dysplastic tissue as a means of cu curing, essentially curing, sin 2 and beyond. Uh, so we do this as a means of treatment. Now, yes, we are going to take this tissue and biopsy it and make sure that we've gotten everything out. And we want to have clear margins, but this is treatment. LEAP is treatment. And there's other ways that you can treat. Well, like I said, there's cryotherapy, there's coinization, uh, but LEAP is the most common one. It's the one you should be aware of for the test. Okay, so I would say that for the test, if you get a question, and I doubt it will come up, but for USMLE step two and step three, if you have a woman coming back positive for SIN2, SIN3, and histology, if it asks you what to do next, your answer should be LEAP. Okay? So the natural history of SIN lesions. So SIN1, as you can see, has a much different history, than, or has a much different natural progression history than SIN3. So SIN1, 90% of these are not going to progress any further. And that's why we're a little bit more conservative, especially with younger women. We're a little bit more conservative in how we treat this. We're not going to go in and leap SIN1 patients because 90% of these patients are not going to progress. Fewer than 1% progress to invasive cancer. And that's what we're really worried about. Okay, you have SIN1, you have SIN1. Not a big deal. It's not going to kill you. It's only going to kill you if you go to invasive cancer and, you know, you are one of the people that die from cervical cancer. But the vast, vast, vast majority of these patients are not of, who have SIN1 are not going to get cervical cancer. And so we find that rather than leap them and cause all these complications, it's easier to just sit on it, wait, and test them later. And if you take a woman who has SIN1 and test her a year later, 60% of, the, of them are not going to have SIN1 anymore. They'll be normal. 30% of them will still have SIN1. And then we just check them again in a year. 10% will have progressed to SIN3, and those patients we will leave. And very, very few will have progressed to invasive cancer. Few enough to where we don't leap them with SIN1. It's just not worth it. Okay, with SIN2, it's a little different. Now, these, we can, again, we can be a little bit more conservative because 75% of them are going to either be the same or spontaneously regress. 20% will go on to SIN3. And so we're a little bit more concerned with SIN2. 5% will go on to invasive cancer. Now with SIN3, you can see that, uh, that about 1 in 10 to 1 in 5 will go on to invasive cancer. So we always leap these patients. But for the test, know that SIN2 and SIN3 are going to go on to leap. SIN1, we sit and watch. Okay? That's all I've got for you. Hopefully all this stuff is now up to date and you're aware of how we go about uh, doing PAPs and the recommendations for for monitoring women. Uh, remember, age 21 to 65, some caveats and exceptions. We went over that. Um, and then we're mostly leaping women with SIN2 and beyond. SIN1, we're a little bit more cautious, and we wait and you know take a, wait, a, a watch and wait approach. Uh, any questions, go ahead and write me a note below. Otherwise, I will see you in a future lecture.